tell you, the Lord has gifted Sherwood Church with so many talented people to show forth his glory, and I am just amazed every time I step over here. Matter of fact, when I came back last week uh, from sabbatical, uh, I was just clapping and praising God, and I looked at my phone, and you know how technology works. It says, it looks like you're working out. <laughs> That's what it said. And so the Lord has done great things here, and tonight uh, we are going to just spend just a little bit teaching tonight. If you could bear with us, about 30 minutes teaching. Um, one of the things that this age has brought are questions. Questions about what we do, when we do it, how we do it. There's such a wealth of information out there on the internet and other places, and and people are searching those sites trying to find answers. And sometimes when people ask, I've learned that the church does not have all the answers. But what I do know is the Bible does. So we're going to pray and ask the Lord to be with us, ask him to guide us and lead us, open up our hearts to understanding of the scriptures and not ourselves. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. God, just like we just sang, you are a God of the impossible. There is nothing too difficult for you. Father, we thank you and we lift up our hearts to you and we pray that you open up our hearts to understanding the scriptures. Just like you did for the apostles in Acts, God, as they spent time with Jesus, he opened up their hearts to understand his words and the words of the Father. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be with us tonight, that you would guide and lead us in truth, if there is anything that is said that is not like you, Father, I pray that you remove it right now in the name of Jesus. I pray that you're glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said amen. amen. So over the last 16 months, we have seen just an influx of technology booms in different areas of our lives. And COVID has really brought a lot of that to the surface. And I just think about the technology that has come out, and you think about some of the new things, and you think about the first one that comes to my mind is Zoom meetings. Zoom meetings. Some of us have been Zoomed to death by now. <laughs> Not only did Zoom meetings open us up to people next door and across the world, open that camera opened up to their home, but it also, for people who didn't know how to use Zoom, it showed us the inside of their earlobe. <laughs> and just as we expected, we could see all the way through. <laughs> Some of y'all will get that later. <laughs> also, it opened up Google Classroom for our students. Some of them loved it. Some of them hated it. <laughs> that Zoom Classroom, my kids, man, they got on it. Some were, they're people. They like people. And so they were like... I like Zoom, but I like being around people. Amen. Others are like, man, this is great. I could just get out of the bed, eat breakfast, get on Zoom, get off, and go back to bed. <laughs> they loved it. Now, the next uh, innovation that came that I saw during COVID probably uh, should be awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. The Little Caesars Pizza Portal. I, I, man, that was great. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. You got your pizza, and you're gone. You're out of it. No talking, no nothing. Just give him my pizza and I'm out of here. <laughs> the shopping to go orders were great. You drive up, you open up your trunk, they put the groceries in, they close it, you drive off. Online shopping hit a high, Amazon, Wayfair, and those companies hit some real highs as this was going on. But also, we saw this in the church as well. And as we started sitting at home and uh, getting, getting online services, we could sit at home. We could log in with our family. We could eat breakfast. Uh, we could talk about it. We could discuss it. We had moments of devotion, moments of prayer, moments of time and reflection. And I just got to tell you, it was good. Good times of devotion. But although those were good moments... Please understand this. The church 
was never intended to live or grow in isolation. We are the body of Christ. Each joint functions together, and we don't do that unless we are together. And so it allowed me to just kind of sit down and take some time and start thinking about church. Matter of fact, why church? If someone asks you the question, why do you need to go to church, I think most Christians will normally point to Hebrews 10.25. Forsake not your, the assembling of yourselves together. That would be one of our go-to scriptures. While that is true because it is the word of God, what else are the benefits of coming to a local assembly? And so that's what tonight we're going to talk about tonight. Now, this I'm going to tell you what this is not. This is not a bashing for all the people who are currently at home. Okay? It's not that. I understand that different people have different reasons why they're at home right now. And so our job as the body of Christ is not to break each other down, but to build one another up until we get home with the Father. Amen. That's our job. And so whether they haven't reached this point or not, whether they came back or whether they're still dealing with special circumstances, our opportunity as the body of Christ is to pray and love them right where they are. But this is also not a sermon to champion those who are already here. Because I know that not everybody who comes to church comes for the right reasons. Some people come out of habit. Some people come out of guilt. Some people come out of the obligation to please someone else. My mama said we always got to be in church on Sunday, so that's where we're going to be. Praise God. But if that's your only reason for coming to church, it's not a good reason. You should come to church to know and understand more about God. So the people tonight who will benefit from this service, number one, me, is the first I'm benefiting from this, is the people here who have a friend that say, you know what, I don't need to go to church. I've got church right in here. They need to know why they need to be in a place, a place, a worship assembly, worshiping with other believers. This is for the child who's preparing to go to college. If you've got co children in college or you yourself are getting ready to go to college, you know, and you're going to get out there and you're going to start going. I think, Garrett, if you talk about the statistics, uh, 70 to 80 percent probably don't come back to church. You know why? Because they don't understand the benefits that come out of the general assembly of the saints. Or, you may be here and you're a believer and you say, you know, I hear you, Pastor Ken, but man, Sunday morning, Sunday night, you know, connect group, I don't think it's that all that's needed. We're going to talk about that as well. So if you can, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And as we jump into that passage of Scripture, I started looking at first, I thought it was important to start finding out where was the word church first talked about. And even farther than that, where were the first assemblies first talked about? When, when did God find it important for people to assemble together? And so you look at the Old Testament and you'll see the consecration of Aaron and his sons in Leviticus 8, 1 through 4. You'll see that God assembles this congregation together uh, at the doorway of the tent of meeting to talk with them. He says, it's important that you come because I want to talk with you. There's another example in Joel chapter 1, verse 14. And this is what he says there. He says, consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord, and cry out to the Lord. He also says, providing water at Bear. That is in Numbers chapter 21, verse 16. It says, from there they continued to Bear, and it almost looks like beer, but it's actually Bear, from there they continued to bear there that that is the well where the Lord said to Moses, assemble the people that I may give them water. 
And so just in these three short verses, you see the Lord calling the people together to corporately hear the word of God, to attend special ceremonies or festivals. You also see God calling the people together to experience miracles or to see what the Lord has done together. And you also see the Lord calling the people together to pray. And so God finds it important for his people to join together corporately to hear what he's saying. But then after that, I said, okay, God, I understand it in the Old Testament. What does it look like now in the New Testament? And when you see it done and said in the New Testament, you will see the word church. Now, the word church, the Greek word for the word church is ekklesia. And it is an assembly or a religious congregation. People who have been called out from the world and to God. I know you can barely see that. But people who have been called out from the world and to God. The ecclesia, the called out ones. So as I look at this scripture and I look at this definition, this is not a location. This is a description of the people that God calls his people who have been called out of sin and darkness and to himself. That makes sense? And so as you read the Bible and you read specifically through the New Testament, you'll see the church at Ephesus, the church at Rome, the church at Laodicea. You'll see because it is saying these are the called out ones but they just happen to live in these certain areas. Amen? Amen? So that is the church. And when you think about the church, and you have been saved through the blood of Jesus Christ, you now are part of that church. Amen. You see the church talked about as Jesus commissions Peter in Matthew 16, 18, and he says... And I also say to you uh, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. This is Jesus first commissioning Peter to be uh, the one who sets or launches the church. You also see in Ephesians chapter 1 the position of the church. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. And made him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's the position of the church. So here you see Jesus talking about, now, Peter, you're going to start this church. You're going to, you're going to allow this church to start, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. This is my church, Jesus is telling him. And this position, God says, or we talk about here in Ephesians, that this church now is positionally under Jesus Christ. It is the body of Christ. And so now that we've seen that God is pleased with the gathering in the Old Testament, he also talks about it in the New Testament. I said, God, I want to understand what are the benefits? What truly are the benefits from gathering together? as a body of believers. And so here in Acts chapter 2, we land. And I prayed about this. I said, well, God, how do I talk about it? Where do we go at in Scripture to find this? It says, go to the beginning of the church when the church first starts and to just give a brief history to get a good understanding of how the church starts it's probably important to go back to the book of Luke's because b the book of Luke because Luke actually writes the Acts of the Apostles, and at the end of Luke he ends the story and then it picks up at the beginning of Acts and he starts talking more. He says, "Okay, I've talked about this before in Jesus' ascension, and now he starts talking about the church. Now he starts talking about this launch of believers or the explosion of the church." And so in Acts, Acts 1, he does that. He talks about how the apostles return uh, to Jerusalem for the Mount of Olivet, and they await the promise of Jesus. And that promise is what? The Holy Spirit. 
They're waiting on the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said he would, they would be his witnesses. But the Holy Spirit must come to empower them. And as they were waiting and praying, the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they began speaking in different languages. And Peter preaches a sermon. And during this sermon to all the people who are listening, you have to read this because this is really incredible. As Peter starts preaching this sermon, he starts taking the Old Testament and tying it in with the coming and ascension of Jesus. And it's incredible. And so the people are listening to this and they're remembering the Old Testament because he starts talking about, hey, you remember in Joel when they said this? You remember when David said this? What they were actually talking about Christ. And I believe that the people were just in such amazement, like, wow, we never knew that. And as they were listening to Peter and as he was preaching this incredible sermon, 3,000 people get saved. 3,000. Can you imagine just Sherwood, just one day, we walk in here and it's like, poof, it's just a whole nother church here. That's what happened. When the Holy Spirit came, Peter preached a sermon, and in that sermon, and it wasn't a three-hour sermon, it was probably more like five minutes, 3,000 people came to knowledge of Jesus Christ and became children of the kingdom, just in that short period. And so as this church exploded, let's read now in Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47. Here it is. So then those who had received his words were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. Let me stop right there. Can you think about that day, how eclectic that environment must have been? All those people coming to know Christ, you know, just one after one, another after another. And he's preaching and people just coming and coming. And man, people are like, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And it's just eclectic. And I mean, it was just incredible. As I read this, I start weeping. Because I can just imagine how that would look. And people are coming. And listen to what he says here. And, and 44, and, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all. And anyone who had need, they were like, hey, do you got a need? I'll meet that need for you. Hold on. Let me go down here. I'll be right back. They go down and cash out their car or something like that or sell their house over here. And they come right back. Hey, if you got a need, we're going to fill it. And you see this body of Christ just blowing up, you know, just multiplying. It's incredible. And, of course, you've got to understand that they weren't just doing this in isolation. The people were looking like, man, what in the world is going? Man, I heard some people showed up talking gibberish, and next thing you know, man, the church just started blowing up. And it wasn't gibberish. It were different languages. The church just started exploding. Man, people were selling stuff and bringing money back to the temple. Man, I want to go down there and find out what's going on down there. Listen to the Bible. Look at the Bible. Verse 44, and all those who had believed were, were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possession. They were sharing them and everyone that, who might have a need day by day, continuing with one, watch this, day by day, continuing with one mind in where? In the temple. There was a place selected for them to come and hear the word of God. Now, let's continue to read. And breaking bread from where? House to house. So they weren't just performing all these functions for these new believers at one person's home, okay? I've heard the argument among believers. If you look at the book of Acts, you know, there were house churches right there. What does the scripture say? It says they went to the temple and they were going to the houses. Amen? Amen. All right. Don't let people deceive you. Look at what the scripture says. Now, as it did that, they were going from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. 
Incredible. That was the launch of the church. As a matter of fact, that was the promise that Jesus made to Peter in Matthew. He says, upon this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. This was the launch of that particular scripture. And so here we are. 3,000 new believers, the Holy Spirit dwelling in each one of them, the mission is to go out and be my witnesses, and they found it necessary to gather as believers to look at the purpose. God, why are you sending us out? We need to be equipped to go out. And so they gathered together. So let's examine the purpose of those gatherings and the benefits. The first one in verse 42 was to hear God's word, to hear God's word. There's nothing more important than hearing God's word. If you go to a church or you have family members that go to a church and they open up the Bible and they say one paragraph or one Bible verse and close the Bible back, Bible, they're in the wrong church. One of the purposes for all these new believers was to hear God's word. And one of the benefits for us assembling here together is to hear God's word and God communicating a message corporately to a people. Now, he can do it individually. Yes, he can. But as you have seen throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, God most times communicates with a body of people or a gathering of people corporately to get the message out to him, to them. The second benefit that it added, it had someone, a pastor, a teacher, someone committed to prayer and called to the teaching of the Word of God. Someone committed to prayer and called to the teaching of the Word of God. One of the most encouraging things for me, and I think most of you in here have experienced it, is that when I came to Sherwood Baptist Church, we went on the church tour. Who else did the church tour? Everybody did the church? Most everybody. And I walked into Pastor Michael's office, and I saw all those books. Books after books after books after books. And I found it encouraging that we have a pastor, or we had a pastor during that time, And we have a pastor now that commits themselves to the teaching and prayer of the word, through the word. Amen? You don't want some person that is fly by night coming in and just giving you anything, just opening up one scripture. You want somebody that is committed to the teaching of the word of God. And so that assembly of people afforded them the opportunity to do that. The third thing is it created an environment to grow mature believers. It created an environment to grow mature believers. The funny thing was, as COVID opened up and things started happening, and we were going to church and we were like, man, this is great. You know, man, we're sitting here together. As time went on, little things start creeping in. We would let the dog go, and it seemed like the dog just got the devil in him as soon as the message came on, just running around, jumping, biting kids. I mean, it was crazy. We could throw some clothes in the washer. We could start dinner. All these small distractions start popping up. Emails start coming up. Notifications start coming up. But when we come together and gather together like we are tonight, the distractions are minimized. Amen? Amen. We can come to a place and we can focus on what God is saying to us. We can come to an altar and pray. We can seek the Lord without or minimal distractions. That's one of the benefits of coming to an assembly where God is present. The second point would be to promote fellowship among believers. Promote fellowship among believers. You can see that also there in verse 42. They say they were devoting themselves continually to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, encouraging one another, encouraging one another. It's one of the first points, encouraging one another. 
The, Bi the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you also are doing. I remember the first day that we came back in this building from being gone for a couple of months from COVID. People were so happy. Mask, no mask. And I was like, oh, okay, here we go. Hugging and rejoicing. And I noticed that people missed that. They missed the assembling of believers together. And they needed to see their brothers and sisters in Christ there with them. You know, it's one thing to have a Zoom meeting and talk to people on the phone, but it's another thing to have someone there standing beside you, loving on you. So they're encouraging one another, serving one another. 1 Peter 4.10 says, as each, of one, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the multifaceted grace of God. Serve one another. We saw that not only here at the church, inside of the church walls, but we saw that outside the church walls. We, we were able to come in and mobilize and get a strategy together and pray over it and go out and serve and see people saved outside of our community. And so this place, this location provided a launch pad for us, for the church to actually go. Amen? Encourage one another. Serve one another. Love one another. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The fifth one would be to bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. We need each other. If you're going through a hardship, it's good to have somebody there close to you that you know is praying for you. They can wrap their arms around you, pray over you, tell you scriptures, encourage you in the Lord, bearing one another's burdens, going back home and weeping over the things that you've heard from your friend. And you just, we need that, the fellowship of the saints. But guess what it also does, the fellowship does? It tells us to warn other believers, to warn them. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 through 14 says, Take care, brethren, that there not be any of you, uh, any one of you in an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast to the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. So this assembly, this fellowship of believers, we are to encourage one another, serve one another, love one another, bear one another's burdens, and then also warn other believers that, hey, you're getting too close to the edge. Come back. We've got a lot of work to do. Point number three. After we, hear, after we heard the word of God, we're fellowshipping. Those are benefits inside of fellowshipping. Also, to break bread together. Now, this, this had to be the Baptist part of it right here. We were breaking. Amen. We need to break bread together. We need to sit down and get some chicken or something. I don't know why every time I preach, food comes up in every sermon that I preach. Break bread together. You know what? I noticed that when you sit down and break bread with someone, it opens up a whole new dimension of your friendship. It does. I had a guy we were working with a couple weeks ago, and I was trying to get him off the street. And, uh, you know, he was ready. He was like, just tell me, tell me what I need to do. Tell me where I need to go. Tell me, you know, he was just really into it. I said, you know what? I said, let's go have lunch. <laughs> Sat down with him. We had some lunch. We broke some bread, broke some rib, broke a lot of stuff. <laughs> But the longer we sat down, the more he opened up, the more relaxed he became, and it opened up our friendship together. And so it talks about breaking bread together, and then when you do that, these are the benefits of breaking bread together. You're interacting with different believers. You're interacting with different believers. You can't stay in the same circle. When you start breaking bread with one another, 
you start interacting with different believers, understanding how they, they, you know, what's their testimony, how they came to Christ. I mean, you're just really interested. One of the people that I see that does that the best is Stephen. Stephen invites you in your house, and you, you would think, man, you're part of the family. You know, you sit down and break bread together, and y'all are talking, like, wow, I feel like I'm part of the family. Ken Kendrick. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> you feel like you're part of the family. And as believers, that's the way it should be. If you're a brother and sister in Christ, man, you invite somebody over, man, kick your feet off, yeah. Don't put them up too high now, but yeah. Come on, yeah, let's, let's sit down, break bread together. Get to know them. Share, tell me your testimony. Tell me how the Lord saved your life. What has the Lord done in your life lately? And when you do things like that, you become endeared with other people. And I want to issue this challenge to many of you in here. Continue to open up your house for opportunities like this. Open it up. Because when you do that, you'll start being able to interact with other believers, understand and hear the heart of other believers. So interacting with other believers, learning more about believers, hearing the testimonies of those who are serving with you, and intertwining your lives together intertwining your lives together. There's such a benefit in that. As a matter of fact, on the 25th of this month, when Pastor Paul comes and preaches his first sermon, that night we're going to have a fellowship in the park. That fellowship in the park is meant for this particular purpose, for believers to come and break bread together so that we can get to know and fellowship with one another. Amen? Amen. So I want to see your face in the place. <laughs> the last point. To unite in prayer. Uniting in prayer. I don't think we understand how important this is. I am still studying and understanding the importance of prayer. I can tell you and I pray it is important because God hears us. But corporately coming together and praying is a whole, it takes it to a whole different level. I have seen in Scripture, throughout Scripture, when believers come together and start praying, God does miraculous things in their midst. I mean, just awestruck events. As a matter of fact, in Acts, when you look at the book of Acts, the, the apostles were praying, them and probably about 120 other people. They were, they were praying and, and praying and waiting on the, the Holy Spirit to come, and, and God started doing amazing things in their midst. And so when we're uniting in prayer, you know, one of the benefits to that is corporately praying, corporately praying. In Acts chapter 1, verse 14, they said all these were continually devoting themselves with one mind to prayer. Along with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and his brothers, they were all praying and seeking the Lord. The next time, the next point or the benefits to uniting in prayer is a focused prayer time. Just like we did today during the house of prayer, we prayed for Pastor Paul, him and his family coming. We got a body of believers joining together, seeking the Lord, uniting in prayer, focused prayer time. And then that last one is praying for others. Praying for other people. You know, we don't understand that benefit. When we start praying for other people, interceding, that's what we call it in the Christian faith, interceding or intercession for someone else. That is very, very important. That's one of the benefits of coming. So when you don't come, or you have people that don't come, they're missing out on all these benefits that are afforded to us in the gathering of ourselves together, hearing the word. So next time somebody tells you, well, I don't want to come to church. I don't, I don't you know, I, I heard the word already. Well, it's not just for hearing the word. It's for fellowship, breaking of bread together, uniting in prayer. All those things are combined when we meet here together. The Bible says that we are members of one another. I need you. When you come and you're on point and you're doing what God has called you to do, man, the body is functioning properly. 
Not only is it functioning properly, we can see people saved when everybody is doing what God has called them to do and we're gathered together in unity. The Bible said it is good and pleasant when brethren dwell together in unity. It's important that you be here. I need you. You need me. Take it from one song, we're all a part of God's body. (laughs) So to close, God never intended for his church to live in isolation. He never intended that. And I realize that there are some people in different areas of their lives, and but we need to come to hear the word, to fellowship, break the bread together, and unite in prayer. So as we end the message for tonight, I got three last points, very short. And mainly this first point, I'm talking to people who are looking at us or live streaming. And if you're at home and you're not ready to return, we love you. And this is what we want you to do. We want you to send us a comment. Let us know you're there. I'm still here. I'm a a part of the body. I'm a part of the church. We want to hear from you. We want to send you a prayer card. We want to wrap our arms around you. As much as we can, as a body of Christ, still come around you. You're still our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we love you. The second is is if you're home and you're okay with gathering and you just haven't made it back yet, we want you back. We love you and we need you. You're part of the body. If you're okay with coming back, we need you to start functioning, serving, loving other people. We need the body. We're part of Christ's body. And the last part, if you're here in the room or you're visiting with us, with us online and you're looking for a church, I know this great church. The church being a body of believers located at 2201 Whispering Pines Road. And we would love to have you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you're part of the body. And so when we talk about why go to church, those are four good reasons to come to church. To hear the word. To fellowship together. To break bread together and unite in prayer. May God bless you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for everything that you do in and through us. Thank you for allowing us to gather together as the body. God, we are your body. And God, we don't want any member to be left behind. We don't want to be negligent or leaving any member behind. God, because we know that when we come together in your name, God, we can hear your voice, hear your word together corporately. God, we can also fellowship together, but Lord, also we can break bread and pray together. Lord, let us not take that lightly. Father, we thank you, and we love you for all you're doing in our church and in our community. Help us to understand the bigger picture of why we gather together, not just for just coming and being a part of something. But Lord, we gather for a distinct purpose, to love, serve, and worship you. Father, it is in these things we ask in your son Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. At this time, our executive...